Hello sports fans, here we go. We're going to work on the third installment of our What Molecule Controls Gene series. And this is really the definitive uh, video for that because if you remember from the video before, this gentleman, what's his name? Uh-huh, that's right, Oswald Avery. He figured out that DNA was what uh, was the molecule that did the controlled our genes because he figured out that if you took DNA away, transformation would not happen. Whereas if you took any other molecule away, transformation still happens. So Avery figured this out. But as your book points out, scientists are kind of a skeptical group. And they like more than one experiment to, fig to kind of uh, give them a lot of evidence. Okay, so uh, in 1952, and you remember Avery's experiment happened in 1944. In 1952, after the war, when a lot of research was going on in the United States, these two Americans, Martha Chase and Alfred Hershey, did the next experiment we're going to talk about. And this really is the experiment that definitively said that DNA was the molecule that controlled our genes. And if you look here, uh, it's kind of interesting to note that Martha Chase is a woman. And the reason that's interesting to note is because women did not, were not usually scientists at this point. She was kind of one of the early ones in her field, and, and as far as I know, things went okay for her, but you're going to hear about another scientist soon that things, that was a woman, that things didn't go as well for. But as far as I know, Martha Chase was respected, and of course history uh, gives her as much credit as they gave to Alfred Hershey. So these are the two scientists that worked together to figure out uh, the DNA definitively, for once and for all, that DNA was the molecule that controlled our genes. So, that's Martha Chase and Alfred Hershey. Um, so what did they do? Well, before I tell you what they did, I need you to understand a couple things. So you remember our, the, uh, vir the initial research was done on the Streptococcus bacteria. And so uh, these guys kind of took it further. They came up with this great idea. They took this thing, which is really cool looking, right? And what it is, is it is a bacteriophage. Of course, these pictures weren't known to them back then because we didn't have that technology, but now we do. And a bacteriophage is a virus, and this is what the virus looks like. And this virus, uh, it really has two parts, but I'll talk about that in a second. First thing, though, is this virus attacks bacteria. This is a bacteria cell right here. There's the cell membrane, the phospholipid bilayer. Here's the cytoplasm in here. There's all sorts of endoplasmic reticulums and mitochondria and Golgi bodies and stuff in here. Uh, well, actually, maybe not as much. But anyway, it doesn't matter. But the point is, is this guy, what he does is he attaches to the surface. And I have a little better drawing. Let me show you here. He attaches to the surface. And um, let's see if you can see that. He attaches to the surface, and he injects part of his body into the bacteria. And then that part of the body makes more of these bacteriophages because it's carrying the genetic information. And if you remember, the genetic information is essentially a blueprint. It tells the bodies what proteins to build, and then those proteins make the body. So uh, this genetic information made proteins that made more viruses. And when there was a whole bunch, the cell ruptures open, and out they go free, and they infect other bacteria, and that's how that works. These viruses are specific only to bacteria. They don't attack like a human animal cell or a plant cell or even a yeast cell, a fungus cell. They attack only other bacteria. Well, um, this is exactly how the flu virus is spread for us. It attaches, it injects material, it makes more bacteria, and then those back, or no, I'm sorry, not bacteria, more viruses because the genetic information combines with the with our cells' DNA and combines, makes more bacteria, God, I can't even talk, more viruses, then the cell breaks free and those viruses go out and attack other cells, and that's why we have the flu, okay? Okay, uh, so if you look here, so it injects, it copies, it releases, and that's the three stages here, okay? So that's what these guys figured out. Now, what they didn't know here, let me go back to my original drawing, what they didn't know here they knew that there was this protein coat. This was all made of protein, okay? And they knew there was some material. They knew it was DNA inside here. But they weren't convinced which one of these things got shot into a cell because they didn't have pictures like this. They couldn't tell if it was the coat that got injected or the DNA that got injected, okay? 
So they came up with a pretty clever experiment to see which one got injected into it. And here's the experiment. Let's see if I can do this. Let's move this over to the side. Basically, what they did was they made a culture of bacteria. Okay, they made two cultures, really. And they added um, sulfur. So let me... But it's not just any old sulfur. It's radioactive sulfur. So it was easy to trace. They could find this sulfur easily with their, their uh, instruments. So this sulfur was radioactive. And the other thing they added was this phosphorus. And it was also radio radioactive. Anybody remember where we find phosphorus? Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? That joke never gets old. Uh, phosphorus is found in phosphates. Remember the phosphates surrounded by four oxygens? Turns out the DNA has a whole lot of phosphorus in it because of the phosphates. Turns out it doesn't have any sulfur. Okay? Proteins, on the other hand, have a tiny bit of phosphorus, but almost no phosphorus, but a lot of sulfur. Proteins have a lot of sulfur. So they figured out that, hey, if we mix this and then we look at what is inside the bacteria, if the sulfur's inside the bacteria, then we'll know that it's the protein that got shot inside. But if the phosphorus is inside the bacteria, then we'll know that it was the DNA that got shot inside. That's what they figured out, okay? Which is pretty clever if you think about it. Did, you, did I lose you there? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay, let me say it one more time. Sulfur exists only in protein, phosphorus only in DNA. They want to see what goes inside the bacteria. Okay, so if they find sulfur, radioactive sulfur, inside the bacteria, they know that protein got pushed inside. If they find phosphorus inside the bacteria, they know that DNA got pushed inside. Okay, now, so that's what they did. They infected these viruses. Uh, really, they infected one batch of bacteria with sulfur and the other batch with phosphorus. And then the viruses took that up and then they put them in fresh batches, like this, okay? And then they blended them up. And then they took that blending and put that tube into a centrifuge. And if you don't know what a centrifuge is, it's a really fast-moving wheel that spins around about a thousand times a, a minute, I don't really fast. And it's just like uh, when you're on a merry-go-round, and as it spins, you uh, get, you know, stuff gets forced to the outside. That's the centrifugal force. And what um, happens is the heavier stuff goes kind of to the bottom, and the lighter, liquidy stuff goes to the top. Okay? And so they, they have names for this stuff. Uh, the, the heavy stuff here is called the pellet, and the liquid stuff is called the supernatant, and I will show you that. Okay, so pellet is the bottom stuff, this kind of the heavy stuff, and the supernatant is the liquid stuff, okay? So when they ground all this up and they spun it around in their centrifuge, um, here's what they found. They found that um, sulfur-35 was found almost completely in the supernatant. And they found that phosphorus-32 was found almost completely in the pellet. Okay? Now, if you missed this when I said it spun around, the stuff in the bacteria inside the cell ends up being the pellet. And the stuff in the protein coat and in the cytoplasm between the cells becomes, not protein coat, I'm sorry, the stuff on the outside of the cell like the cytoplasm and so forth, becomes the supernate. So whatever is injected into the cell becomes pellet. Whatever is left on the outside of the cell becomes supernate. So here's where I'm about to stop. I want you to think about this. We've got sulfur in the supernate. We've got phosphorus in the pellet. I've told you what, what makes the pellet and what makes the supernate. I've told you which molecule holds sulfur, which molecule holds phosphorus. Now I want you to put it together. Can you tell me what Hershey and Chase figured out? If you can't, you probably haven't been paying attention because I've told you the basic. But 
in addition on your paper, why don't you write down how you know what you know, okay? So they are obviously looking for the molecule that controls our genes. They found it. How do you know? What's the proof? Summarize these findings for me and write that on your paper. Uh, if you're not sure, then you can check page 340 in your textbook, and that'll be helpful, okay? But I think you can figure this out. Try to. Think like a scientist. Okay, if you have questions, let me know, and if not, uh, then you can move on to Shargaff's rules. All right, peace out, homies.